Welcome into Ion Northeast Kansas, the podcast. I'm your host, Melissa Bruner. This is where we wrap up the top interviews you saw on Ion Northeast Kansas, the TV show. You can catch it streaming live 4 o'clock Central Time, Monday through Friday, from our WIBW TV studios in Topeka, the great capital of Kansas. We are wrapping up Women's History Month this week with some fantastic guests, true groundbreakers in their professions. We were honored to have the state's Chief Justice Marla Luker join us, the second woman woman to serve on the Kansas Supreme Court and the second woman to serve as Chief Justice. Linda Jeffrey joined her. Linda was the longtime city attorney for the city of Topeka before she retired. Linda was among the first three black women to graduate from Washburn University School of Law. Both fantastic ladies with great insight into their careers. Here's their conversation. Appreciate you taking the time. So Justice Lukert, Second female chief justice. Where did you start in terms of women in law to now be the top of the judiciary in our state? My, my path was that I started with other women around me in law school. By the time I went through law school, there were a fair number of us in our classes. But then when I went into private practice, that changed because there were very few women in private practice. And then I was first a trial court judge in Shawnee County. When I went on the trial court bench, there were no women in Shawnee County. I was the only one. I wasn't the first in Shawnee County, but at that point, there were no other women. And it took a while to build up, um, seeing some more diversity on not only the Shawnee County bench, but statewide at the trial court level. I love how you're both wearing blue because you both are Washburn Law uh -huh. grads. And Linda, you actually were three years before Justice Lukert? Yes, I, I was with the class of 1977, Washburn Law School, <coughs> excuse me, and um, in our class there were five African Americans, three female and two males. And you were the first black women to come through Washburn Law. Right, uh, we were, our class, me and, and Joe and Brenda, we were the first three black females who graduated from Washburn Law School, and that was 1977, if you can believe that. That's not too terribly long ago when you think about it. Did you ever feel that you were breaking new ground? I didn't feel like I was breaking new ground, um, and it wasn't until later that I found out that I was breaking new ground. What I, what I was so pleased with was the education that I received at Washburn Law School, and I felt like that equipped me to be an excellent attorney um, and to go anywhere. I chose to stay in Kansas, but the education, um, the practical skills that we learned, um, the ethics that were taught us, all those things helped the three of us, uh, the three females and, and the whole class to be good attorneys. So you mentioned, Justice Lickert, you had women like Linda come before you, but not necessarily when it came to on the bench. Did you feel the same thing? Did you feel that you were breaking new ground or what did you feel you were bringing to the job um, that was maybe different than men did? I really did feel that I was making new ground. I hadn't thought that much about it until people began to suggest that I think about being a judge. And then one of the reasons they uh, would use to try to convince me that I should do that was that there were not women and that we needed women on the bench so that the community uh, could see that, first of all, young women and others could see that we were, um, a woman could serve as a judge. But second, it's so important to uh, the community to have trust in the judiciary. And a component of that is that the judiciary looks like the community. And it didn't at that point in time. So those were very motivating factors for me to consider becoming a judge. But isn't it, is that, it's kind of funny when you say that you kind of had to be convinced that that was the case. And did either of you feel that you needed a little convincing? Because, you know, women are kind of nice and we sit on the sidelines. When you think of attorneys, you think of hardcore and, and laying down the law, literally. Did you ever feel that there was any sort of a disconnect or what did you overcome to move forward in your careers? Well, what I grew up with, I grew up in a home where education was important mm -hmm. and honesty was important, uh, faith was important. And we were told that we could do and be anyone we wanted to be. And I, I liked the law because I like to talk. Um, I, like to, <laughs> I like to tell stories. I like to visit with people. Um, and I love the law. I love the challenge of that. Not knowing a lot of um, other African-American attorneys, 
it was uh, difficult, but sometimes you just ha you'll have this dream that you want to do something, and my dream was to make a difference in the community. What better way than to go to law school, become an attorney, uh, be in positions where what you say matters, what you do matters, and people you impact matter. We're continuing our conversation with Kansas Chief Justice Marla Lukert and retired city attorney Linda Jeffrey. I'm so glad that both of you could come. We've been talking about leadership and paving the way for the next generation. Justice Lukert, when you look at the face of the judiciary across the board, are we still lacking in some areas in terms of representation? And if so, what, are, what can we do about that? We are very much lacking. The number of women uh, across, when we look at both the trial court bench and the Court of Appeals and the Supreme Court, have increased steadily. Um, our Court of Appeals now is a majority of women, so those are good things to see. But our general diversity in terms of ethnicity and racial makeup is still very far below where we should be. So we have a number of projects that are underway, um, often referred to as the pipeline projects, really working with students even in grade school to consider thinking about the law as a profession whether that be as an attorney or in some other role with the court system or um, then moving on through uh, at each level of the schooling where we're getting programs, having people reach out at career fairs and other things to really try to encourage more uh, people of diverse backgrounds to consider law. When people look at your career, Linda, how can they see that as a possibility? And, and it's amazing to me in some ways that it took until 1994 for Topeka to have a city attorney. Now, maybe that's just a female city attorney, let alone a black city attorney. Um, and maybe that's just because people stayed in the job for a long time. I don't know. I haven't looked at the history of it. But when people look at you, how can that be an example? Well, I've had people tell me that just being able to see a person that looks like them is encouraging. And I feel a responsibility to talk to young people, um, responsibility to mentor younger people, um, to let people know of the various career paths that are available in the law. Um, there's, there's nothing better than being a lawyer, and you can do all kinds of things, but it's the visibility. If you don't see yourself, you don't see yourself. Mm -hmm. So it's, um, I've got that responsibility to get out and I will say anybody that ever wants to call me and ask questions about uh, being a lawyer or you know law school, whatever, uh, I'm more than happy to help them. Plus you'll have a good time talking to her too, I'm just saying. <laughs> what is the biggest lesson, Linda, that you've learned along the way? The biggest lesson that I've learned along the way is that you must be true to yourself. You need to have some absolutes that you will not uh, deter from. Uh, right is always right if nobody's right, and wrong is always wrong if everybody's wrong. And you also need to reach out and talk to other people. No one reaches the top by themselves. People help you. Nobody reaches the bottom by themselves. So I've learned, talk to people, ask questions. Don't be so afraid that someone will think you're stupid. How can you be stupid when you're asking questions? That's um, the only way we learn, right? We right. need one another. Absolutely. Justice Luke, the biggest lesson you've learned. I agree. Community is such an important part of it. I would definitely not be where I am without a supportive community around me. And um, I think it's important that those of us who have benefited from that give back to that. And so that's been a major part of, of what I've tried to do throughout my career. But there is a sense you also need to build, build somewhat of a sense of resiliency because there will be back sets and there, uh, there are roadblocks occasionally and those types of things. And that community will help you figure out how to deal, deal with that. But you also have to have that inner sense of this is what I want to do and I'm not going to let this throw me off that goal. I'm going to continue to pursue it. We are all in this world together. We are. Justice Luker, Linda Jeffrey, so good to see you both. Thank you so much for sharing your paths and your lessons for all of us. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you for having us.
We always enjoy our time with the Chief Justice and with Linda Jeffrey. Linda, by the way, is also a breast cancer survivor and extremely active in the Race Against Breast Cancer fundraiser over the years. That's how I've come to know her, and it's great to see her uh, smiling. You have to watch the video because Linda always has a smile on her face. All of these conversations have been very interesting because the ladies who have broken new ground as they have come up through the ranks have all expressed an interest on wanting to make sure that they pave the way for those who come after and work to lift them up as well. And that is certainly true of our final Women's History Month guest that we had in the studio. Patty Dick spent many years coaching the Washburn University women's basketball team, and she had her own childhood youth athletic experience coming up in the time before Title IX and as Title IX became law. She joined Laurel Westling, who is the current Washburn University women's basketball coach. And obviously, Laura's experience growing up was very different from what women in Patty's generation experience. So bringing the two of them together made for a truly special conversation. Today, and it's an honor to have you both with us, coach and coach. So glad. <laughs> Thank you. And Patty, you did have quite a story. Uh, and, and it starts from when you were young. I think Laura and I are both from the generation that takes for granted. Well, gosh, if you want to join the sports team at your school, you just go out and you have it. Not so for you. What happened when you were growing up? Well, we didn't have really too much of uh, women's sports, girls sports. Uh, especially at the high school level. Uh, in junior high, we, we were able to because depending on who you had for a physical education teacher, um, uh, some of them said, yes, let's do this, and others said no. So I was fortunate to have one that um, let us compete uh, with the other junior highs in Topeka. But they, everything went away in high school, and then uh, when I got to college, finally the last couple years of my college career, we were able to participate, and those were the first teams at Washburn. How frustrating was that for you as a young lady and a young woman growing up? What did you think when they were like, no, we don't have a team for you? It was pretty discouraging, but uh, fortunately for me, I was a softball player, and we had summer softball, and I was fortunate enough to play on a nationally ranked team with mentors like Billy Moore, Judy Akers, uh, and those kind of role models. So um, I really valued that, and I knew that was the best time of my athletic life, for and sure. Title IX came about at what point in your life? Um, when I was uh, a senior at Washburn. A senior at Washburn yes. University. So put mm -hmm. a pin on that for a second, because that came along. And like I was saying, Laura, what were your opportunities in athletics growing up? I mean, you know, compared to uh, what Coach Dick was mentioning, we feel, like you mentioned, so fortunate because we were able to participate. We were kind of in the time of growing the game, both in just competitiveness and then uh, opportunity, you know, whether it was in the summer or in AAU uh, or college, uh, you know, college scholarships and everything were kind of growing along with that time. So uh, compared to, I mean, coaches' generation, I'm like in awe, and then I think uh, you know, our current players looking into what we were looking at and like, uh, you know, some of the AU systems and things like that, they're kind of in awe. So uh, the growth has been tremendous. When you look at your players today, what kind of opportunities are you able to give them and why is it so important to be able to offer them those opportunities? Well, I think athletics just brings so much to people's lives, uh, young people especially, you know, when it comes to leadership development, confidence, um, socialization, which I think we know has all taken a hit in the last few years. Uh, you know, it, organization, responsibility, it just, the list goes on and on. And I think it's also important for young people to find something very early where they uh, belong or they have something to do and they are able to connect with other people. And then, you know, that kind of continues to grow, whether it's in a collegiate sport or just the relationships that, you know, are fostered in early athletics. It just, I, I think it's critical. Having the teams is one thing, and I want to ask you guys this question because it's a good contrast between the generations. How many scholarship players do you have, and how many meals can they eat during the season? Yeah, so we have, uh, we are a fully funded Division II program, which allows for 10 uh, athletic scholarships, and they eat well. I can tell you that. <laughs> coach, when you started as coach, how many scholarship players did you have, and what kind of meal program did you have? We had zero and zero. <laughs> <laughs> I think uh, we did a little bit of money uh, in 1982, 83, and I had one player who uh, was an All-American, transferred from Nebraska, and she um, got room and board and one meal a day during the season 
So, of course, we had to practice after the men, like at 5.30, mm -hmm. unless they went over, then you, we'd start at 6 or 6.30. And then when she'd go to the dorm to get her meal, it was a sandwich in the refrigerator. So that kind of tells you about where we started. Exactly. Your players don't eat cold sandwiches. They've got no. something better than that. Okay. Yeah, no, they're, they're pretty, <laughs> that is, the nutrition and, and meals is not something on the complaint list. How hard did you have to fight to get more than that? It was a battle, and you really had to pick your battles because uh, there's people that really didn't like me very much <laughs> a lot of the times, and uh, but you know, I just had a passion. I because of my softball experiences, and I knew I was so blessed to be able to participate at that level uh, with those women, and uh, we'd go to. Connecticut in the national tournament and have 10,000 fans there. And I just wanted to do everything uh, that I could to uh, promote girls in sports. Continuing our conversation with Patty Dick and Laura Westling, so glad to have you both with us. Okay. When you reflect, Coach Dick, on how far we've come, have we come far enough? No, <laughs> that probably won't happen in my lifetime. Uh, but gosh, you made great strides and just looking uh, watching the games in, in this uh, uh, 2024 NCAA tournament. It's just incredible, absolutely incredible what women can do now. What does it mean to you to see that, that hype around, you know, particularly Caitlin Clark in Iowa and the records and breaking the men's record and pointing out, ha-ha, we've got the, the ladies in charge now. <laughs> <laughs> Brings tears to my eyes. It yeah. really does. Yeah, it just uh, warms my heart to see this. It's great. What about for you? What hope does that give you in terms of being able to build your program and, and get excitement around the women's program? Yeah, I think it's uh, really a testament to the generation before us, the coaches that have put in so much work and so much resiliency to grow our game and give young women opportunity. And then I think for our generations, you know, to take that torch and move it forward, make sure we're not getting complacent in the opportunities that we provide and, and the quality of opportunity that we can provide women, um, I think, it's our duty to take that torch and move forward, um, you know, and to see the women's game, what it's doing. I think that's been a progress from grassroots youth level investments. Uh, now, all of a sudden, universities are making investments. We're catching up on coverage investments. I'm hopeful for the time that one out of five stories isn't about how one of the women's players reacted or something they said or something that was caught on a hot mic. I'm hopeful that eventually it will be about simply the basketball, but in the meantime, uh, we have some incredible ambassadors in our game. Where do you feel that responsibility? And, and, and Washburn University it has been fantastic in terms of there's a, there's a woman president now. Mm -hmm. uh, so, but yet at the same time, where are some of those holes? Where are those gaps? You mentioned media coverage for one. Yeah, I'm, I'm really fortunate. One of the reasons I, you know, so excited to come back to Washburn is that it's really an institution where if Washburn's name on it, it's going to be great. They really want greatness in everything that Washburn represents. Uh, not every school or university is, has that kind of same uh, drive or same vision. But, you know, as the whole, I think the women's game, you know, we, media coverage, I think, you know, is a huge one. You're going to see as, as those stories are being told, as those storylines are, are, you know, brought to people, then all of a sudden the human interest increases and then viewership increases. And then uh, when people watch, they realize there are incredible athletes playing this game and advancing it in a way that, you know, a lot of people like to watch. I think unselfish, mm -hmm. uh, fundamental basketball mixed in with some elite athletes that maybe before, I think, in the women's game everyone could identify with. Now you're watching the women's game and being like, yeah, I could never do that. <laughs> <laughs> what do you say to somebody like Coach Dick? Uh, the way? And I, I think I say it every time I see her and I hope, uh, and it will never be enough, but just thank you and, and, and to her mm -hmm. and and to all the women that have forged the path for us to be where we are. It's, it's humbling and uh, it just, you know, it brings tears to my eyes <laughs> thinking of, of the efforts and, and bravery it's taken to get us here. And what do you want Coach Wessling to know? Uh, boy, n not only are we building great athletes, but uh, even uh, my early teams, uh, not only were they great athletes, but they were great students and they're successful women now and they're in positions of leadership. And to me, that was the number one key. It was very easy to sell Washburn University because I sold uh, their educational program first and then athletics second. 
and they're just tops and it's yeah. getting better now and I'm so happy that uh, Dr. Mazicek is leading the way now. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, predictions for the women's tournament. Who's coming out on top? Is this going to be the Caitlin Clark year with all the hype that's surrounding her? Or who's, the, who's your sleeper team? We, we were down. I don't know if there's a sleeper with the, the juggernaut of South Carolina. And that's, ah. uh, I'm hopeful they'll get some talent somewhere, but I think they're just as good as it gets this year. Okay. I agree. That's who I have. South Carolina. South Carolina. All right. We will see how that all shakes out. But such a, a blessing and honor to have you both with us, Coach Dick, Coach Wesling. Thank you so very much. And thank you both for paving the way for generations of young women. We appreciate it. And thank you, Melissa, yeah. for all you do too. Thank, thank you. you. I learn something every time I have a chance to visit with Coach Dick. She, by the way, is a Hall of Famer. So we congratulate her on all of those achievements and Coach Wessling on continued success at Washburn University. So with those leaders in mind, we also look to the young leaders in our community who are making a difference. The 20 under 40 class for 2024 is taking nominations. This event and is a fundraiser for the Jayhawk Area Council of Boy Scouts. Amy Pinger is the committee chair this year year and she joined us to let us know about the nomination process. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much for having me. This is an exciting time because there are a lot of lifetime achievements and year after year of contribution type programs. This one is specifically for the young people. Why is this still so important to honor the young leaders in our community? Yeah, this one is really exciting. Um, you and I are both past honorees. I was um, in the OG class. Yes, you were in the I'm original over the hill class now. <laughs> and I was in 12, so it's yes. been a minute for me yeah. too. But it really does give people that first um, recognition and that first um, nod to all that they're doing because the goal is to recognize young leaders who are making a contribution to the community in a positive way and to recognize them, share their stories. Um, it raises funds for scouting and scouting is all about leadership development and providing opportunities for youth and so connecting them with local leaders in our community every year and highlighting those stories is really important. And there are so many inspiring people every year, but I think sometimes when you're just starting out in your career or starting, you know, to have a few years under your belt, you kind of wonder, well, am I on the right track? Is yeah. anybody noticing? And this gives some validation to that. Yeah, absolutely. That validation. And it's so important, too, to look at personal and professional. I think people underestimate the service that they give back to the community. One of my favorite stories last year was the mom who talked about, in my professional world, this is what I do. And uh, then she said, and then on the personal side, I coach my kids' soccer team. Mm -hmm. And these are how I apply leadership lessons to the soccer team. And so it's really, we're looking for diversity in our applications. We're looking for um, national service. We're looking for a lot of different things that folks are doing. I was going to say, what sorts of things do you want in that application? Because it's not necessarily the person who is the youngest ever CEO of whatever yep. company. Yep. Yep, it is not necessarily about your titles. This is about how you are leading in the community, how you're creating change in the community. It is about who you are as a person. So it is that, you know, person who's served in the military that's had deployments. It's that person who coaches soccer. It is um, all of those people who are volunteering and giving back to this community to make it thrive. And you mentioned the recognition event itself is a fundraiser for the Jayhawk Council of yeah. Scouts. What are the qualities that make this such a natural fit to be a benefit for scouting to recognize leaders? Yeah, scouting is so important because it is looking at that leadership. It is looking at those values of trust and authenticity and really showing up and giving back. And so that's what we do with these leaders every year is who is modeling that for these scouts um, and how can we pave the way for more scouts to become leaders in the community. Nominations open today. They do. How difficult is it to nominate someone? Oh, what do you need to do? It's so easy. So you go to jayhawkcouncil.org uh, and then you fill out the nomination form and really you just give us a couple sentences. I think people think it's you know, big application, it's a couple sentences, an email and a phone number. And then so. from there, the nominees are contacted and then it's on them. If they yep. would like to further pursue it, they kind of give a little bit more of their background. Yes, absolutely. Well, I, I know it doesn't take long because I filled one out today. I'm so, so excited. It was very, very easy to nominate someone. So think about the people in your life and who you think should be recognized. This is for community members in the Topeka and Shawnee County area under the age of 40. You have until June 17th to submit a nomination. Jayhawkcouncil.org slash 20 under 40 is where you go to submit it. And then in no, they, they'll be chosen. And in November, we'll have a wonderful event to recognize them all. Yes. Appreciate it. Amy, thank you so very much. Thank and you. Get the wheels turning. Get those Absolutely. nominations in. Thank you.
you might have caught there. I was in the original 20 under 40 class. In fact, there was such a great application process that time. They chose 21 of us for that very first class. It was a very fun experience. Amy has a past honoree, has been a past honoree herself. And every year when you go to the event, you see some young professionals and young leaders doing great things in the community. And it's so nice to have all of them contributing to our quality of life in Topeka and beyond. We are glad that you could be with us to share a few moments with us as well. Remember, you can see videos from these segments and all of our guests on Ion Northeast Kansas on WIBW.com. You can also find them at our WIBW 13 News YouTube channel. Be sure to click subscribe while you're there. I also post them on my Facebook page, which is WIBW Melissa Bruner, along with our studio selfies, so you can get a little bit of a look at the behind-the-scenes fun. Glad to have you along. Until next time, we'll see you on the Red Couch.